Lord Jesus, this is your word. It's so powerful. It's so true. It's so right. It's so righteous. You're one with your word. You say it. You mean it. You are it. We won't stray from it. We won't deviate from it ever because it is everything. Our whole walk is based on this, not ideas of man. There's all these DIY, do-it-yourself, here's how you can get better books out there. None of it works. It might be temporary solutions, band-aids. But Lord, we were made to be eternal, and your word is eternal, and you created us to live forever one way or another, and that is why this word matters so deeply. There is freedom in this word. There's healing in this word. There's safety and protection in this word. This word stands like a wall around things that would claim our lives. This word stands like a wall around things that would claim our eternity. We love you. Open it up to us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So here's how it reads. Here's Acts 24. Acts 24 is so uh, big to do. Paul's in Jerusalem. Uh, they try to kill him, big mob, they're beating him up. Um, you know, Claudius comes in with his guys, his Roman guys, his troop. They, they rescue him, Claudius Lysias, and he, then he sends him off to Felix because he's like, I can't get to the bottom of this. I put him in front of the Sanhedrin. They're fighting with each other. They don't even know what they're accusing him of. So I'll, I'll send him to Governor Felix and see if, of Judea and see, see if he can figure, a procurator, see if he can figure out what to do with this guy. Meanwhile, there's, a, there's, a, there's 40 people who are like, well, we, we won't even eat food till we kill this guy. Like, like it's serious. We're going to kill him. And then he sends him with almost 470 men, spears, cavalry, spears, all of it, sends him off, gets him to Felix. He's now in jail with Felix. He's like, where's this guy from? Because Felix doesn't want to deal with it because Felix is notoriously lazy and brutal. And they're like, he, he's from Cilicia. He's a Roman citizen. He's like, dang, I got to deal with this guy. So he puts him in jail, and he's like, well, I'll figure it out. Uh, and five days later, he doesn't have much time to figure it out because here comes Ananias and the Sanhedrin and their lawyer, Turtleus. So they've got, they've got a case against him, but you'll notice they have zero evidence. So start, and, and honestly, people look at what Turtleus says, and a lot of historians are like, that was like the lamest lawyer of all time. Like, he had nothing to say. He, 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 he's got no evidence, and, and he, he says this little spiel, and it's completely ineffective, and Paul easily defends himself. But if you look at what he said, knowing he came in there with no evidence, he's like the punk attorneys you've got today that know they have no case, and their goal is to just win the case regardless of how much Evidence is stacked against you. Or we got nothing stacked against this guy. Let's make up some fictitious things that are believable and then try to make it look like we can convict him. So he's one of these guys. And what he does is brilliant, but it looks like it's entirely lame. So let's just start there. Five days later, I mean, he's just, just barely in jail with Felix. The governor. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. And when Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. Oh, we have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you any further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. Okay, I have to stop here because this is just a grisly amount of flattery. There is no historian anywhere that has anything good to say about Felix. He was known as the worst and most brutal governor that Judea ever had. He is not a nice man. 
He's not a good man. He doesn't do anything with any vision that helps this Roman province get any stronger. Matter of fact, he's so brutal that it's due to him that there's that giant revolt in 66 AD that ends with 70 AD in a bloodbath and the Romans destroying the temple, desecrating it, and killing just thousands, tens of thousands of Jews so that blood spilled all over the stairs like water. This is that guy. He started this mess. And he started it by going to Caesarea with a bunch of troops while Paul's in jail, by the way, and just destroying and killing a bunch of Jews in Caesarea so that they could steal their stuff. And he tried to make some reason for why he did it, like he was putting down a rebellion. He wasn't. He was just literally looting their homes with Roman soldiers. He was caught at it, and although he had tremendous favor with the emperor, they finally pulled him out of there. They had nothing else they could do to keep this very lame leader in place. So he's called back to Rome. We even, but he, it's due to what he did that starts these zealots like, we got to do something. This is just insane. We, we have to fight. Fight or die. And it continues under Festus, and it continues until there's just such a mess that no one can unravel it except for the Romans coming in and just trouncing everything. He's a bad man. He was born a slave. He was born a slave in the emperor's home. And he and his brother Pallas, they grow up there, and they actually take care of the palace. And they do, his older brother in particular does such a great job at it, he wins tremendous favor with the whole emperor and his family, so that they gain their freedom, and then they get put, and this is not like Rome, they get put in governor positions and then higher positions. And Felix gets his position because of his brother's awesome behavior as far as being such a p politician. But he himself is just like that loser younger brother that gets all the benefits from having a better older brother. And so he just like, he does everything wrong. Every time he does something really brutal, he just gets away with it because he's loved by Rome. By Roman leaders, not all of Rome. He's the spoiled brat younger brother, and he's been put as procurator, governor now, of Judea. So in this little chapter, it looks like he's kind of not that bad of a guy. Like, like he's just this Roman governor. He doesn't really do anything really brutal to Paul. And you're thinking, wow, not so bad. He's a politician. It does not help him to do anything to Paul right now. So he just lets him rot in jail until the next guy takes over. He doesn't want to deal with the problem. But Tertullus, the governor, and all of the Jews know this. They know it's a mockery to come in and say, Most excellent Felix, your insight has helped the nation. What a leader you are. I mean, they're just slathering it. It's the same guy that's going to kill so many of their countrymen and has already, actually. I don't even know if you remember a couple chapters ago when, when Claudius Lysias grabs Paul, from all of these guys are beating him, he says, are you that Egyptian that led all these people out into the desert a little while ago and had this big revolt? Are you that guy? He goes, no, no, I'm a Roman citizen. That Egyptian was put down by Felix, brutally, ruthlessly going after him, lying to other people to, who he knew were friends to get him to go, promising him safety, get him to go a certain route so he could just kill him. He hired assassins to kill the chief priest, Jonathan, at the temple with daggers just, and just walk away. The Jews hate this guy. Most excellent, Felix. You're so amazing. We love your leadership. Would you please kill Paul for us? So Turtles knows what to do. And he brilliantly goes after, first, Felix's pride. Verse 5. We found this man to be a troublemaker. He stirs up riots among the Jews all over the world. That part's the only true part. <laughs> he doesn't try to. The Jews stir up the riot. He just walks into town, talks about Jesus, and the rest of it's just like, he just pulls the pin and the grenade goes off. 
stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. He's saying he's from Nazareth. Even the apostles before their apostles, Nathaniel, his, his brother Philip, come on, come on, we found the Savior. He's this guy from Nazareth. Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? He's talking about Jesus, but since he's from Nazareth, that can't be a good place. You, I don't think you found the Savior because there's no way he came from there. I always like to compare that to something, but then someone's always from that place, so forget it. <laughs> you know, something to kind of make it more realistic, but I'm not going to do that today because if that, that's backfired on me, so I'm not going to. We found him, he, he's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect, and he even tried to desecrate the temple. So now he's appealing to, hey, you're trying to appease the Jews. I know you like kill them half the time, the other half time give them gifts. Then they give you bribes, which is what you're after. He's always after bribes. Then you do some of the stuff they want. It's like this political game you play. You have no friends on either side. You really don't care that much about Rome. You came up in it a slave. You just love the position they gave you. You don't care about the Jews because you just can get benefits from them if you treat them nicely sometimes. But then other times you're just ruthless to them because you're benefiting Rome. He's a Nazarene. He stirs up trouble. His riots all over the world. You can, you can look into it. He's everywhere he goes, he's in jail. He's beat up, you know. He's a ringleader of the Nazarenes, those worthless people. And he even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him, your, him yourself, you'll be able to learn the truth about all these charges we're bringing against him. Yeah. And he's saying that. Because they have no charges to bring against him. Amen. He walked into the temple to bring gifts for the poor and to pay for some other people who wanted to do this ritual, which they would approve of. And they just started beating him up. Like he didn't do anything, and he knows that. <clears throat> Verse 9. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. There was a bumper sticker a little while ago that I actually did like. You know the one I hate. There's many that I hate. But my, God is my co-pilot. is my least favorite bumper sticker of all time. I hate it. It makes me want to cut it off people's cars. <laughs> but there was one I liked. And it said, do not underestimate the power of a whole bunch of stupid people who think the same way. Don't ever underestimate that. It's a powerful thing. So the other Jews joined in the accusation asserting that these things were true. So they're all just, oh, yeah, it's true, man. It's true. We all saw it. They were the ones beating him up. We all saw it. He came in. He started this trouble. He did all this stuff. And, and they're like, he did. We're, they're the ones that did it. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul, you, know, you want to answer these Accusations, Paul? Paul replied, now notice he does not begin with any flattery. There's nothing, there's nothing here for him to really offer Felix. He will do that. Even when he started just in the last couple of chapters in front of the Sanhedrin, and they're hurling accusations, he walks in the room, he says, punch him. They punch him in the mouth. He's like, come on. God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. He says to him, and then, and then the guy's next to him like, that's the priest, that's the chief priest, you can't talk to him like that. And then he's like, okay, there's a scripture that says I shouldn't do that, so sorry. He can't offer anything good to him, but he does apologize for not following the word. Because he knows Ananias is, is, he's just put there by Rome, he's nothing. But his position means something, so he's respectful. Here, he's respectful again, but he's got nothing that he can say to say, wow, Felix, most excellent, insightful, brilliant leader, Felix. He can't do that. He's an honest man. Paul replied, I know for a number of years you've been a judge over this nation. <laughs> this is good advice, people. This is good, this is good political advice, but it, it's good democratic advice. If you're just trying to just start something positively with someone that you've got nothing good to say about, just state some fact that almost sounds like a compliment. It kind of yeah. lets them listen. You know, it wins enough ground to get their attention. 
He, he simply says this. This means nothing. I know that for a number of years you've been a judge over this nation, so I gr gladly make my defense. That's not a compliment, it, but it's not negative. He's just stating a fact. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city, and they cannot prove to you the charges that they're now making against me. However, I admit... I worship the Lord of our ancestors as a follower of the way which they call a sect, like a, like a cult is what they're basically calling it. I believe everything that's in accordance with the law and is written in the prophets, meaning the same as the Sanhedrin, and I've got the same hope in God as these men themselves have, as my accusers have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Now again, he's throwing out that R word that really infuriates the Sanhedrin, the whole resurrection, because most of them are Sadducees and they don't believe in angels and they definitely don't believe in a resurrection. They think that it's all about this life and that's all you got. And they're sad. You see? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't not do it. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a, ra a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. And right there, right there, I can see Felix grabbing the bottom of his chair. I, I don't know if you've ever been somewhere where your behavior was on trial. And it was uncomfortable because people were bringing up something that could be very incriminating to you and really could set things up in a bad direction for your future. So I can see him kind of grabbing his chair. It's, it's, it's an uncomfortable place, especially if you know you're guilty. He said, there's, there's going to be a resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. If you're wicked... Your hope is, I just die. Then I sleep in the dirt, and there's peace, and there's no more of this struggle. There's no more of this chaos. There's no more of all the things I feel guilty and horrible about that I did, or that were done to me. I'm, I lived this life of attack and counterattack, and now I just want the peace of sleeping in the dirt. Maybe I'll be a butterfly. Maybe I'll be, you know, something cool in the next life. And then you start making up all this stupidity. The wicked don't want to hear about a resurrection. Because right now, he's on the side of the gavel that makes a decision for someone else's trial. But if you're wicked, you're going before a judge that you have no strength to resist. And you have to listen to him make a statement about your eternity. Not your next five-year sentence. Five-billion-year sentence. It's forever. That's frightening. We get away from it. We get away from it because we don't even want to think about it. Because everyone in this room, whether you're a believer or not, has in your head the understanding that God is real. You can try to outthink it and make it go away, but he's real. And you can kind of, and you try to outthink, as a Christian, that whole hell part. And I do. I, 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 I search the scriptures for some way that maybe they can be saved after that mess. Why? Because I love people. I know a lot of people that don't know the Savior that I know, and he's the narrow gate, and he's the only way to salvation. Because Felix wasn't the only one born a slave. We all were. Scripture says we were born slaves to sin.
born slaves. You want to acquire your freedom? It comes through Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed at the cross. It comes one way. It comes only one way. And I'm not a, I'm not a fear-based preacher because I don't feel like, like, uh, like I've said before, you know, you, fear causes you to behave well when you're under the authority of the person in near proximity and then you just stop doing it. Yeah. Kid would be 26 years a teacher, just whipping through the halls, run, come around the corner, see you, oh! Goes past you, <laughs> they're off again. Just behaving in the moment that they're in your presence. Slowing down on the highway. Oh, is that a, oh yeah, slow down. Eh, he's kind of far back. Okay. Fear can capture your attention momentarily. But grace and love captures it eternally. Most people are not feared into the, into the kingdom. Most people are not scared enough to come in through the gate. Although some are. And I have, I, have, I have several friends that heard a message about heaven and hell and would not leave that church until they had solved that problem with God because he used that tool with them. The words all over it. I have a lot more friends who went through hell on earth and had everything coming to them for being a jerk. God showed grace and in tears they came running to the king. And basically, that's all of us slaves to sin. Yes, sir. When suddenly he just walks into your life and shows you who he is. And that you're not defined by what you did wrong. Amen. You're defined by the scripture that you're his child. Just invite him in. That's what generally draws us. Genuinely draws us. And, let, and people that are drawn by fear initially, if their faith is ever going to grow, they've got to get there anyway. They have to get there. Because no one lives in fear and perfect love casts it out. Amen. Okay, that one was for free. It wasn't part of the message. God... I have the same hope in God, verse 15, as these men themselves have, that there'll be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Ah! So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings at the temple. I was ceremonially, ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this, and there was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges against if they have anything really against me. But they weren't, obviously. Or these who are here should state what crime they found me in when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It's concerning the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you today. He brings it up again. And believe me, the Sanhedrin are biting their tongues till blood's coming out right now. The Sadducees are like, I hate that word. And Felix is like, I hate and there's a few Pharisees who are like, no, no, he's right. But we still want to kill him. <laughs> Look what Felix does. He hears the resurrection word a second time. This court's not over. No decision's been made. No gavel strike. No, no anything. He's got the Sanhedrin before him looking for an answer. Turtleus, the lawyer, is here looking for an answer. Actually, actually, there was a picture of Turtleus. Let me, let me pull that up. So just, if you didn't know what he looked like. <laughs> so I, again, I, I couldn't not do it. All right, so... 
Look what Felix does. Here's Felix. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. Want to know why he's well acquainted with the way? Because Philip, the evangelist, and his four prophesying daughters set up camp in Caesarea, and that's in his jurisdiction, and a church went boom there. Under his jurisdiction, and then, and then Paul, even when he got back to Jerusalem, there are like thousands and thousands of, of, of Jews are now believers. They're still kind of stuck in this legalistic thought process, but they are believers. So the sect, the cult, has gone and he's had to deal with this again and again and again with this coming up and the Sanhedrin wanting to kill people who are part of this cult called The Way, following Jesus. He's well acquainted with it. Well acquainted with it and has not responded to it. Boy, that's like so much of America. Churches on every corner. You, you, you drive, if I drive home from here to just Augusta, just church, 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 church. Turn on the channels. You're going to see something about a church somewhere. Often not so good when it hits media. But you just got to, anywhere, any workplace you're in, there's a Christian somewhere. Somehow it's going to find its way to you. And people are well acquainted with it. They're well acquainted. You can bring up the name Jesus like, oh, yeah, no, I've heard all that. I've heard all that. Well acquainted. But that means nothing. I was talking to a friend that I really care about. And one of his struggles was, it's like there's just too much stuff. There's too much bad stuff that happens in the world. It cannot be a God. How do you explain that? It's too much stuff. And that's usually, you know, where this friend lands. And I, I feel for him. I feel for him because he can't see it. There's a price to this. Yes, Jesus is the Savior, but I can't say it enough. I just, I went, when Andy said it to me that time, it's so stuck on me. He's got to be Lord. He has to be Lord. He's got to dictate your decision making. He's got to dictate your thought process. His word has got to be the double-edged sword that fillets you and makes a change. That cuts it out. That, that separates you from your bondage. Because you won't see it until you make him Lord. And that was our conversation. You know, I prayed and prayed and prayed and this didn't change. This person prayed and prayed and prayed and that just kept getting worse. Well, you can pray all you want if he's not your Lord. Right. You can pray all you want if you're not willing to make him Lord. If you're only looking for just someone to save you out of your current dilemma, you have not come to Jesus the Savior. You have to, he has to be Lord. That's the difference. How did all these prayers go unanswered? They go unanswered because he's not Lord. You're wanting him. Now, you can be an unbeliever, don't get me wrong, and you can pray for something with a righteous heart, and God can do it and then get your attention through it. With grace, save your soul. But so often people are praying, 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 but they have no respect to the God they're praying to. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and nothing happened. Well, do you believe in God? No. No, I'm an atheist. Well, what are you praying? He has to be Lord. Understand that. If he's not Lord, then, you, then you, who are you talking to? Felix was well acquainted with the way, but not really. You can know about something and not know someone. You know about someone, but not know them. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I'll decide your case. Meaning he's putting it off. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So it's like, wow, this guy's kind of a nice guy. He's just playing a game. This is not a nice man. But God's using it to benefit Paul and to make sure Paul gets to Rome. 
Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and he listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. Look at the word. The word's telling you exactly what's happening. The Holy Spirit's telling you this is what's happening. Felix is trembling. If you thought he was trembling in that court, grabbing his seat, he's really trembling now. Two more things have been added. Paul has a chance to talk to Felix. What can I tell him to get out of jail? I know. I'll talk to him about righteousness and the judgment to come. He's not trying to get out of jail. His goal is to get to Rome. He's trying to save Felix's soul because he feels sick for him because he can see he's been born a slave and he's still a slave. And he doesn't know it. He's still a slave. He's a slave to sin. He's a slave to Rome. He's a puppet. He can't change anything. Only Christ can change it. The same guilt, the same pain, the same sting, and I just want to die, and I don't want there to be resurrection. If there's a resurrection, that doesn't go good for me. So he hears about the resurrection. He doesn't want anything to do with it. But like so many, fascinated. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid, and he said, Ah, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. Hmm, politician. So he sent to him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but Because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Drusilla is a piece of work. Drusilla's gorgeous, like drop-dead gorgeous. Everyone knows it. It's, It's documented in history how stunningly pretty she was. Felix, 30 years older than her, sees her at 16, is like, I got to have her. She's already married to somebody else, betrothed by her brother to this person. Because her brother is King Agrippa II, King Agrippa I. He's the grandson, no, actually the second, sorry. He, her father, dies at, when she's only six. He's the grandson to the one that killed all the babies in Bethlehem. This is the Herod Agrippa family. They're they're a piece of work. She's married into it. There are three beautiful daughters to this guy before she, at six, watches dad die. And now she's like, oh. And he's also the Herod Agrippa. That Agrippa, King Agrippa, that you read about as uh, James gets put to death. He's the one that did it. Then he takes credit for being like God, and God wipes him out. And his six-year-old daughter is just coming up. So then the brother decides, well, I don't want to deal with her anymore. I'll marry her off real early. Everybody's interested. Even at this age, she's like super pretty. So there's this king that's interested. He's even willing to get circumcised because they still hold to some Jewish faith to marry her. She doesn't like him. She's looking for a way out. Felix comes to town. He's already married to two other women. One of their names is Drusilla. He's got a type. He's got two Drusillas now. He he comes into town and says, hey, leave your husband. Come follow me. Yeah, he's a king, but of this little thing. I'm, I'm a Roman leader. I have way more power than that king, even though I'm just like what would look like a lower position of governor. You know I've got way more power than him. She's like, hey, that's a pretty good plan. So she leaves with him. She's still married to the other guy, but she lives her days with the other guy until Felix finds a way to kill off the other king so that there's just no loose ends. It's not documented exactly that Felix killed him, but most people kind of know. It's how he behaved. So now Drusilla's with Felix, 30 years older, 
At the time of this trial, she's about 22, and he's 52. And, and the third wife, but she's just so stunning that she, she's, she's his crown. They have a kid together. They have two kids together. After that whole debacle with Jerusalem that he created, Rome just kind of slides him back to Rome, and he just kind of disappears from history books. You really don't know what happened to him. But it's extremely well documented what happened to her. She was in Pompeii in A.D. 79. Have you ever seen those pictures of the bodies that they exhumed under 75 feet of ash from Mount Vesuvius that erupted in 79 and sudden ash cloud around the world? Uh, have you ever seen those where they dug them out? They, they, they realized, whoa, whoa, these, these are actual like plasters of people's bodies because the ash came so fast down the side of the mountain it just burned everybody's skin off their bones but, but then formed around them as it was happening and then cooled and it just made all of these cavities. So as they're digging and finding tiny little holes and it would just break away, they would fill it with plaster, dig around it and pull up actual bodies of the people like casts of the people that were there at the time. It was amazing, unbelievable discovery. They found all kinds of things that perfectly preserved. It was a perfectly preserved city under all this ash. Herculaneum was another city. They were, they were like resort cities. This was like Miami resort cities, sitting right on the water, gorgeous. And they had all kinds of warning signs. The, the things of there's smoke coming out the top of it. It, it. it was well documented that the thing was rumbling, smoking, and would even shoot out some of those, you know, some of that ash now and then, but it wouldn't be enough to make them all leave. And it was still just selling tickets to go see Pompeii and then the people that just lived there. If you were rich, that was a destination that you wanted to make it to. Drusilla did with her son, and they got buried. It's where she died at 40 with her son. And one of those casts might be her. The shocking thing was there was so much evidence that this thing was going to blow and that they were all going to get buried and die that they should have just all left. It, it wasn't like it blew up with no evidence that this was going to blow. That they, they were going to die at some point, but everybody just, well, I mean, it'll happen when it happens. It's a beautiful day. I'm taking the boat out. She sat in the courtroom with Paul who said, there is some rumblings. There's some smoke. There's some ash. There's a danger coming. You're going to die. And you're going to face a courtroom like the one I'm sitting in. But when I go there, I've got eternity facing me with Christ. Peace and every tear wiped away. And living with the king that's adopted me as his own son. That's where I'm going. You could go there too. No, no, no. We're acquainted with the way. Here comes another one of these heretics. There could have been a guy in Pompeii. World's about to end. There were all these signs and they didn't see it coming. There were all these signs in this courtroom and the majority of them did not see it coming. That whole Sanhedrin, they're all going to be dead very shortly when Rome squashes the Jews of Jerusalem. They're all going to be dead. And, they'll ne and, the, and, 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 and the Sadducees will never rise again. They'll never even be heard of again in history. It's all coming. It's all coming in a couple of decades, and they're all going to be gone. They'll all face this king. They'll all face this God. Born slaves, died slaves, slave to sin. What could have taken care of all of it? The blood of Christ. And he he's trying to tell them. He's trying to tell them. He's on his way to Rome to tell them. He's, try he's trying to get to the leadership of this Roman Empire that's the worst of the worst because they need Jesus because they don't know what they do. And I feel sick. Actually, some people are like, ah, Drusilla had that coming. Her dad dies at six. She's gorgeous. 
She gets pawned off on some king. That king won't marry her because he won't get circumcised. So he gets pawned off on another king. By the time she's 15, she's married, and the guy is also ancient. And so she's married to this person that should be her grandfather. And then, of course, she wants to go with someone that's at least younger than him that comes into town and shows her all this attention. So, so yeah, she goes off with Felix. And Felix makes her number one. There's Drusilla one now. You're Drusilla two now. And, and, and they're sitting there listening. And it says that Felix keeps bringing Paul to talk to him. Yes, he wants a bribe. But he's a f- talk to him. And what does Paul choose? He chooses the filleting knife of Christ. He chooses the double-edged sword. He's like, Felix, you're going to die. And you're going to face Jesus in God, the Father, in heaven. You already know there's no evidence against me. You already know Turtles didn't pull off anything. So that's why I'm still sitting here and I'm fine. But you have a ton of evidence stacked against you. You've got a ton of evidence stacked. And I did too. I was killing these people. I was killing everybody of the sect, the way And then Jesus got my attention. I'm trying to tell you, Felix, so you go where I'm going. Because if you don't, you're going to face him and you're going to live forever, but not. You're going to be in hell forever. It's called the second death. You're alive enough to enjoy it, but you don't get to enjoy anything. You're alive enough to be aware of it. I saw this. I didn't see the movie. I just saw the commercial. It was like such a horrible thing, I was like, that, why would someone even have an idea to do something like this? But, the, but the, the premise of the movie was there was this there was this guy going in for surgery and this, well I don't know what the premise of the movie was, this scene was, there was this guy going in for surgery and they had hit him with an injection that made him paralyzed so he couldn't respond to anybody. You know what I'm talking about? But he could feel everything. So he's going into the emergency room, and he wants to tell everybody, but he can't do anything. They think that he's in this comatose, comatose state so that they can just start doing their surgery, and they do. And the, and the screen zooms in, and you see a tear coming down the side of his face because it hurts so bad, but he can't even move. That's hell. You can experience it, but you don't own it. People are talking about, oh, and I get to hell, I'm going to run that place. Oh, Really? Like you ran this one? You're not going to run anything. You're going to, you'd wish you could run. We are given a free gift of salvation. And here's the thing. You can't be focused on all the sin of other people and what they're doing wrong. That's not what ever gets you saved. What gets you, how's the world so bad? How's this happen? Stop focusing on everybody else's sin. Focus on your own. The way you get free from slavery is you focus on your own sin. This is what was keeping me out of heaven, and it's no blood of Christ on me. Because if that washes over me, and I stand before the Father, and Satan tries to bring up all, drudge up all the stuff, and he's right, there's a lot of evidence there. Jesus just paints it, and then puts the name Jesus over the top of it, and it's sealed forever. You know, no, he's coming in. He's got the blood of Christ on him. It's a Passover. There'll be no destroyer for this one. All, all you do if you don't have Jesus is you go to that courtroom and you stand there and they bring up all the stuff and you got no defense. Well, did you get painted with the blood of Jesus? No, I was well acquainted with it, but I just never, it wasn't convenient. Hear what Felix said. Hear what Felix said. Hear what Felix said. Paul, I love to bring you, but it makes me scared. So I'm going to go back, go back. I'll call you when you're more convenient. I'll call you back when it's a more convenient time. Do we do this with Jesus? Believer or unbeliever? Do we do this with Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. Jesus taught, trying to get your attention about something you know isn't right. Ah, uh, it's not convenient right now, Jesus. 
I'm a little busy. Or, I've heard a lot about this Jesus. Maybe I should go to church. Maybe I can find out. Maybe I should get in a word or read it. They say if I keep reading, it'll start making sense to me because the Holy Spirit, if I invite Jesus, he'll start making some sense. Maybe I should just try. Nah, I'll do it at a more convenient time. How do you know if you're going to have one? Secondly, it'll never be convenient. The word is not convenient. The word doesn't conveniently fit nicely into your life currently. It rips it to shreds and then rebuilds it stronger and better than it ever could have been. I want to read something to you. Bringing the plane in. I had a lot of notes. There we go. This is how this is how Christ said it to me. I was just praying this morning. People want to wait until it's convenient to invite Christ in to be the Lord of their life and get freedom from being born a slave. And Jesus doesn't work like that. He's not interested in your convenience, your reputation, your plans, or even your sin. He's interested in your salvation. It'll never be convenient to fight your flesh to pursue Christ. Convenient is the last thing it'll be. The gospel will challenge everything about how you currently live and how you make decisions, including your whole belief system. There is also no convenient time to get out of debt. There's no convenient time to lose weight. There's no convenient time to go back to school for a better job. There's no convenient time to address a broken place in your relationship. There's no convenient time to stop what you're doing and play with your child. There's no convenient time to stop drinking. There's no convenient time to fight addiction. There's no convenient time to break off a toxic relationship or to begin working on a marriage that's beginning to be that. There's no convenient time to die to yourself, which is what you have to do to invite Jesus in. You have to crucify the flesh. you got to take this belief system and dump it and trade it in for the thing that Jesus had meant it to be all along. I was trained wrong. I was born a slave into sin. I want freedom. Break the shackles, Jesus Christ. Give me freedom, salvation, eternity in a place that is just like something we would only think in fantasy. It's offered to us in the Word. Making us like Him, the Word says. It's not, you know it's not convenient? Doing something for someone else when it's your weekend. Like what was just done for me. Thank you, Mike. I drove here safely. I actually wasn't in that car, but. <laughs> so I did, you know. It's not convenient to go after a hurricane and help people dig their houses out of the mud. It's not convenient to give up money to someone else who needs it. That's not convenient. It's not convenient to do these things. That you find in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He'll sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He'll separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. And then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you're blessed of my Father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I was hungry. You gave me something to eat. Not convenient. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Not convenient. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Definitely not convenient. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. Not convenient. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Highly inconvenient. And then the righteous will answer him, 
When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did <coughs> for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. And then he'll say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So the devil's not running it either. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when do we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and didn't help you? He'll reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you didn't do it for me. Then they'll go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. See, it wasn't convenient, so they didn't bother with it. There's no convenience to it. People will kill a child because it's not convenient. It's called a medical operation. It's not convenient. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he'll have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. Whew. Was it convenient for Jesus to assume flesh? from the safety of heaven and get beaten and mercilessly have his beard plucked, his, his face bashed, and, uh, you know, thorns pulled over his face. And that's just at the end. That's after fasting. That's after living like he was nothing. Just, just low-key human after being the head of all of the whole universe. Everything he created, and he walks into a little mud puddle called Bethlehem, and he just lives out this life to die for us so that we would have a way to make it to heaven because the sinless lamb, the perfect sinless lamb, it had finally reached that time where everything they'd been doing for thousands of years was finally going to make sense. Here's how you draw close to God, through that lamb. It wasn't convenient the way he saved the world. But it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. What does that mean? That means that when God is speaking and tugging at your heart, don't sit there like a bump on the log like Felix did because it's not convenient to invite him in. Don't think, well, it would be inconvenient to change my life right now. Uh, some of the people in my life will think I'm part of some cult or sect called the way if I start to be a Jesus freak. It's not convenient. It's going to kind of mess some things up. Don't, don't overthink it. Jesus is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. He is what his word says he is. He's one with it. And you can be free like he says you can. He also says, Jesus himself, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will, will be opened. Well, Jesus, there's only certain ones that were chosen that are going to make it. Really? Because his word's telling me that anyone can ask. Anyone can knock. Anyone can seek. But keep seeking until you find. Keep asking until you get an answer. Keep knocking until the door swings open. It's fast food society. We just want everything so quick, so easy, so, so just. We're willing to go to four years of college, or at least used to be. It's kind of a mess right now. But we're willing to fight for certain things that we're going to get something back out of, and, and people won't fight for the gospel. Or, or just to fight to get it part of their lives. I'm going to ask you, listen, take a moment. We're just going to be quiet for a moment. 
and just bow your heads. And not because it's embarrassing to accept Jesus, but because we're not going to put any pressure on someone who doesn't even believe. But I guarantee there's someone in here who's struggling with this. It's as simple as this. You just say, Lord Jesus, I'm asking, please come into my heart. I'm seeking. I don't understand this, but I want to. And Jesus, I'm knocking. I don't want to be a slave anymore to my own fear, to a slave to my own convenience. I don't want to be that person anymore. Please come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and live there. You'll be my Lord. Just, it's just quiet for a second. There's some people thinking that through. You invite Jesus to be your Lord. You come grab one of these Bibles off the staircases on the side of the stage and you take it with you and you read it. Lord Jesus, I am also praying for those of us that are believers. Ignite your people. We too often fall to convenience. Help us not to just call on you when it's convenient. Help us not to avoid fighting the flesh because it's not convenient. It means I got to get up and do stuff. Help us to purposefully include you in our lives in every decision. You're the Lord. Before I do stuff, I want to ask you, is this what you want me to do? Before I make a decision, I want to ask you, is this the right decision? But, and then I want to obey that answer that I get. And if I don't know, then, then close the doors that are wrong and open the doors that are right. But I'm giving you first dibs, Jesus, because you're my Lord. And I'm knocking about something else, Jesus. In this congregation right now, there are people very, very sick. They battle something they've been battling a long time. I'm asking for freedom for them from that. Some are finding out recently what it is. It's scary. Others are just still battling. They know what it is, and it's scary. So we're asking you, Jesus, for the healing that we see so often in your word. And we're asking you, Father, to heal hearts because there are people born slaves that need their freedom. It is this simple. You've made it this simple. You said, for God so loved the world that whosoever should believe in you, believe in you, would not die but have eternal life in you. And you'll come and make your home in us. Call out your people from those that weren't. Call out your people from those that are. Light a fire in us, Jesus. We don't want to suffer fleshly convenience. Ask this in your name. Amen. If you're sitting here, I'm just going to hang here for a little bit. If you're sitting here and you're like, oh, I am inviting Jesus in. I'm not sure if I did it right or if I should uh, do anything else or I just don't know where to go from here. I'm just up here. So please come talk to me. And if you're not doing that, um, give room for someone to do that. I'm just going to stay here for that. Have an awesome day. God bless you. If you're staying for the members class, we'll start that at noon. Thanks, Xavier. God bless, guys. Have a great day.